Hello, every, hello everyone, and welcome to Access Chat today. Uh, today we have a special guest, Elizabeth Patterson, joining us, and I'm going to have Elizabeth introduce herself in just a moment. Also, my partner, Antonio Santos, is joining us from Ireland. I'm joining us from a rainy day in Virginia, and Neil Milliken is uh, not joining us today because he is uh, celebrating an anniversary. So, uh, welcome to Access Chat. So, um, Elizabeth, I know um, I, I took the easy way out and I just called you Elizabeth Patterson, but really, that's not your full name. So, will you give us your full name, tell us where you're joining, and just give us a little bit of information about your life. All right. Hi, Deborah. I know that uh, you also celebrated an anniversary yesterday, right? Yes. 34 so, years. happy anniversary. Thank you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Ekpienya. Yes, congratulations. Elizabeth Ekpienya Patterson, and I'm the executive, the founder and executive director of the Girls Education Initiative of Ghana. And I'm calling with you right now from Ghana in Kumasi. I'm in my office in Kumasi. Excellent. So it's Excellent. a pleasure to join for today's chat. Yes, we're, we, um, I had the pleasure of interviewing you on my radio program, and you have a beautiful story to tell, a story of um, when life throws things at you, you know, truly the old saying of uh, when you have lemons, you make lemonade. So it's a beautiful story. I also know that you are a very humble woman and um, get nervous in interviews and stuff, so we appreciate that you are uh, letting us film you and talk about your life. Because <laughs> I know that's hard for you, so uh, we really, really appreciate it. <laughs> yes. So, um, and, thank and, you very much. Speaking of being nervous, I recently had to do. A, go ahead, Elizabeth. I recently had to do a presentation for um, the. I recently had to do a presentation for the U.S. Embassy, and the like the nerves were were so spot on. And <laughs> likewise, the last the last time we spoke. For the, the podcast, I was equally nervous. But okay, so about me in a nutshell, I'm Elizabeth. I was born here in Ghana um, almost 32 years ago. And almost, I, I can't believe that. When I was 10 years old, my family in 1995 left Ghana and went to the United States because my mom luckily won the visa lotto. And then um, my parents were very much, I would say, middle class to just getting themselves up there. They were working class folks, both worked in banks. And my sister and I questioned why the family was leaving our conference here in Ghana. And I remember very distinctly, my parents just kept saying, you girls will have a better education outside of Ghana. And not to say that Ghana's education system is bad, but it has it's um it has its ills and there are things that might okay so it no. um yeah. as, we lost, as you can we lost, we lost the connection let's see yes, if, we... if, if if we if uh there's a way to, for, for us to uh, for it to return back to to the to the conversation because i, I agree think, I, th I think it's worth it to 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 continue uh so what, what actually deborah is how do you uh, have you how uh, were able to find uh, Elizabeth uh, on social? Uh, how, uh, what was the point of connection? Yes, and I agree. We know that since she's joining from Ghana, she's probably going to have, you know, some Wi-Fi cut in and out, and so she will join us again. But I, um, I spoke at the United Nations, and I, um, we, ha I have a mutual friend that is doing a lot of work with. She's a millennial him herself, and her name is Harris Melendez. And she, um, I told her that I wanted to do a series on millennials with disabilities that were making a difference in the world, and she introduced me to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth has. A very very powerful story. I I hope that um, you know her Wi-Fi does allow her to come back on because she has a really beautiful story and um, and it looks like we're getting her back. And so if as this happens, this is just part of recording. And Elizabeth, we're going to continue right where we left off. And Elizabeth, if it's easier for you to not have your video on, 
just go ahead and talk because our audience has gotten to mm -hmm. see your beautiful face and we have you know your picture live so we can if it's easier to talk to you just by voice that is not a problem for our audience okay thank you it disconnected for a second yes yes so we so um, turn in the camera off but yeah, um, it, it might be better for you so go ahead and pick up I, your story so your parents are moving you okay. from Ghana to the United States because they want their daughters to have a better education. Yeah, and both neither my both my parents have I think a year or two of tertiary education, so they always felt like it had they had more education, they would be doing it so much better than they already did or are doing. So they wanted that that for us, and that's how we ended up in the U.S. And so going to the U.S., we um, transitioned our lives and everything was going along very fine. And I was going to a boarding school in Pennsylvania. And unlucky for me, one day in my sophomore year, I was 18 years old. Um, yeah, sophomore, about to, ju junior year actually, going to take the SATs and enter college, um, I was in this horrific car accident, which has left me paralyzed on the left side of my body. Um, the accidents ended up with a traumatic brain injury and that affected, well, it was on the right side, so it affects my mobility on my left side. So I don't have for coming up on 13 years in April next year, I would not have, have, have used my left hand and I walk with a noticeable limp. So that's my story. So out of all of that, um, I was in a coma for about six weeks. And then slowly but surely, I came out of it and decided to go back. Well, I got tutored and graduated from high school and then decided to start college as a part-time student and then eventually got my master's in 2014. And Long story short, after the master's, I came to Ghana and founded GEIG, the Girls' Education Initiative of Ghana, to offer academic and financial support for girls so they could go to school, as well as provide um, support for kids with disabilities within the education sphere here in Ghana. And um, Elizabeth, I know that um, one thing that we're going to do, and I'm sending a link to Antonio, is we're going to put your podcast episode um, where you really deeply do a deep dive into your story on um, Access Chat website so that people can listen to your story. So I'll make sure that Antonio has okay. a link to the program. But uh, so your parents had great hope for you and your sister and they came to the United States for a better life and a better education. And then you experienced this horrible mm -hmm. accident. And um, do you mind mm -hmm. just sharing? I, I know that if people want to know a lot more about your story, they'll be able to go to the radio program. Mm -hmm. but. Um, can you just explain a little bit about okay. what happened during the uh, car accident and if, if you're comfortable and the journey that took you from there to where you are now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So um, the accident, I don't have any memory of it whatsoever, but um, I've been told various versions of it. I've been told by some people that we were driving and it was raining and so that caused the driver to um, maybe panic or the vehicle to i don't know react to the fact that it was rain or what have you you know rain and then driving a van that anything could happen and then other people have also said that we were driving and then a deer crossed the road and then that caused the driver to also kind of want to veer off and then the van collapsed and um, so they say that the van flips flipped upside down or flipped on its side and then everyone got thrown out of the van and unfortunately I was stuck in the van from the waist down and the van crushed my upper body especially my head with a part of my brain coming out from the head 
and then um, my skull fractured. And so I had to be rushed to the hospital because at the time that all this happened, I was pronounced dead. So I rushed to the hospital and yes, doctors can be amazing, right? So they did everything they could, um, took a part of my skull out um, so I could get oxygen back to my brain and moved me, me to um, the children, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania or Philadelphia where I spent the rest of my junior year of high school and the, a good part of my senior year. At, and then throughout that whole journey, as I mentioned, I was getting, um, I couldn't speak for about maybe two months and I was in a coma for six weeks. And when I came out of it, everything was just, I was confused as to why, I always tell people I was so confused as to why my family, we were thinking about moving from our apartment in Brooklyn. And I was questioning why my family had decided to move to a hospital room, you know? And it just, it was a lot of confusion, like nothing was making sense. So um, I don't know if, where you want me to end with that well, journey, but eventually, well, you had I to relearn it. everything, right? You had to relearn oh, everything. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. A lot of relearning and just um, rewiring of my brain to, I guess, learn to speak and then rewiring to learn to walk. And if you meet me, I walk with a noticeable limp. And um, I can't, I'm going to share this because this just happened today here in Ghana, and it will give a different perspective of how things are. Like, what myself and, and one of the managers for my mom's company had to go to um, the central police station this morning so I could do fingerprints for some documents. And when we got there, the gentleman who was receiving us just saw me walking in, and he says to the, my manager, the manager who is with us, says, well, why didn't you tell me the person who you're, you were talking about is sick? And I was like, who, me? Like, and he just, he just, honestly, he really pissed me off. He was just like, <laughs> why didn't you tell me that she's sick? We could have come to the car. And I said, you and I, who is, like, of the two of us, who's more sick than the other person? And then he started trying to justify what he was saying. And I said, I run my own organization and I help my mom manage her business. And so of the two of us, I don't know who's more sick or in your mind, you know. And he just stopped and I was like, you know what? I think you need to apologize for what you just said to me. And I get emotional when when people make those, and I think you could hear it in my voice, <laughs> when people make those absurd comment about something that they have no idea about and I don't fault him because it's it's a cultural thing here in Ghana when people think of disability they feel as though you are not supposed to able to be able to do anything at all at all for for your life and so I went in and then as you know Deborah um I don't have movement of my left arm right and um so to do the fingerprints with my left hand, the man was finding it difficult and he was like, um, how can I help you? Do you want to sit? And I said, well, he said to me, can you stand? And I was, I was like, did you not see me walk into the room? Why are you asking me if I could stand? So anyway, I feel like I'm, I'm dragging on with that story because it's so fresh in my mind. Well, I think, it's a, eventually it's, I think I, it's a powerful story. So this gentleman decided that you, he underestimated you. And people, we don't like to be underestimated, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, a lot of times I ask my mom, in spite of everything that I've been through, why, why do people still, like, feel bad for me or feel sad for me? It's only because... I bet you if my injury was what it is, the brain injury as it is, right? I don't think people would see me as limiting as... Sorry. No, no. Hello? Yeah. It's technology. We can still hear you. Yeah, yeah. It, I think it's always hard 
when people underestimate us, and um, I know that um, my colleague Antonio has a question for you, Elizabeth, but I just think that okay. your story is so powerful, and I, I appreciate that you, um, you know, because people with disabilities, I think, are underestimated all over the world every single day. And I think sometimes in the United States, we like to think, and maybe in the UK, that we're more evolved. And yet, I believe that what you just went through, well, she's sick. Um, somebody underestimating you, I think it happens every single day in the U.S. as well. And people look yeah. at a person with a disability, especially if it is a physical disability, and they just assume that you're less than and I and I'm glad that you get emotional and help them understand that you are a powerful woman and don't underestimate me but let me turn it over to Antonio Antonio no yeah, thank you Deborah uh, I'm, I'm just to, to say you know uh, from how you can you can describe the current situation uh, how uh, Ghana and the government is dealing with uh, kids with disabilities uh, are they you know are they how they are classifying them and uh, how is what type of uh, rights in terms of education uh, uh, do, do do they have? Are they mm -hmm. attend special schools or they are mixed with with with, with the with, with the regular with the regular with the regular schools? Can you provide us a picture of that, please? Okay. So um, in Ghana, I I know for a fact that they passed an inclusion bill or an inclusive education bill earlier this year, and I've been in Ghana for about two and a half years. I've gone to a special school in Kools and it was deplorable. Like being there, I just felt, I felt really sad and bad for the kids. And culturally, when we think of disability here, we just think of people in wheelchairs. And yeah, we just automatically think of people in wheelchairs or crutches or something physical, but two of my girls as part of GID are dyslexic. They're on, they're mildly dyslexic and severely dyslexic. And for those students, um, I, when I first met with the head, um, the heads of schools, they were just saying, oh no, they're stupid. They're not trying hard enough. Like if she tried harder, she, she, would, be a, she would be a really brilliant student. But it just took us as an organization and me as a person who knows of people who learn, who have learning difficulties to actually get these two students um, assessed and diagnosed because I empathize with them and I know what it's like to, to not be able to learn as well as everybody else or with the traditional ways that people are learning. And so to answer your question more concretely, there are special schools, but they're very not patronized. And if you are disabled, in Ghana, um, a lot of things are not accessible to you. I believe that um, there is Act 715 of our, of our Constitution mandates that all buildings have to be accessible or have an elevator, or a ramp, or something that would make allow a person like me to be able to enter and exit the building easily. But that act expired. I believe late last year or earlier this year. And there are so many buildings in this country that I, who I think of myself as a very capable person when it comes to my physical mobility, I, I can't get, I, I can't like go past three or four floors of some of these government buildings or other civilian buildings in general. So the laws are there, but they're not being implemented. Okay, so and for those students and people who have, go ahead. No, so you you were mentioned uh, uh, something you now very important or very important that we addressed in this chat before uh, that you know we, we had uh, several guests uh, who have dyslexia who were uh, diagnosed when they were kids. Uh, one of them was their parents were told, "Oh, mm -hmm. he's, not, he's not going to be anyone in life," and today he managed a, a university in the United States. So, what what type of work yes. uh, what type of work could be done with needs to be done with teachers for them to be more open or at least to be able to recognize those cases uh, and be able to uh, put those students in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So when I first learned that um, 
two of my students who are dyslexic. I bought maybe every book on Kindle or on Amazon that I could find on dyslexia, just to educate myself on the, um, the learning difference. And so for me, I would say that a teacher who is teaching students with dyslexia or other learning differences or disabilities, I would ask that proper training be done for them, proper education be done for them, especially when they're in teacher training or getting certified for their degrees. Um, I believe that a lot of the teacher training that happens here doesn't include kids with special special needs or learning differences. And so when they encounter these students, they just feel as though, okay, so she's stupid or he is stupid and they just brush it aside or because we are teaching so much to the test for the students to, at the end of the year, to be able to pass off to another grade, we're brushing off and leaving those students who may have struggled behind. So I believe that our school system and our teachers need to um, maybe insist on smaller class sizes, not maybe, they need to insist on smaller class sizes so they could focus on every student's learning need. And also, I, I've i never been in a classroom in Ghana where there is, maybe in the special schools, and the other special schools that I haven't visited, there are, but it, I used to be a teacher in New York, and this was my first-hand experience with, um, I think, push in and pull out for kids who learn differently or have learning disabilities. Um, while there was a lead teacher in the room, there is always a special education teacher working with the, the student who had a learning difference. So they would um, either slow it down or take them with a whole different curriculum so these students could understand what everybody else was grasping. So I, I, I believe that it would be a beautiful thing if Ghana and maybe globally more of us started um, adopting these kinds of methods so we can include all learners in our education system. Can you talk us about the work that your organization is currently working and the context of that of your organization in the in fighting for the rights of, of girls and, and kids with disabilities? Okay, so my organization, the Girls Education Initiative of Ghana, or GBIC, has been in Ghana for, we're, we're going to be three years in January. We've been here, I guess, about two and a half years, and we've been supporting 12 girls from the greater Accra and the Ashanti regions, for the, providing them with financial scholarships so they could actually afford to pay tuition and go to school. Um, supplementary academics, such as, um, sorry, supplementary support such as Saturday classes, weekend sessions, um, weekends are Saturdays, after school tutoring, um, one on one individual tutoring when they need um, test preparation and leadership development and, and mentorship. And hopefully soon we'll have um, our public service program which will allow the girls to, um, to be able to have internship opportunities and community service opportunities. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, you might want to... So, um, with respect... You might just want to turn Skype off because we, you don't need it right now since we're on Google. So I don't know if it'll still ring on you, but that might help. It might, yeah. It might, right. or it might so, um, ring in any way. Can you so, hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we can. Go ahead. So um, with respect to disability work, because of our two girls who are dyslexic, um, we've been strong advocates for inclusion of all learners in the school system, especially because we have dyslexic kids right now. Um, at some point, we had one student who, was, who had dyslexia and dysgraphia. Um, no, dyscalculia, she was struggling with both. And so we, we go into the schools, we talk to the heads of schools and explain to them, as I was mentioning before, what these um, learning differences are and how they and the school could best cater for the students in general and how to have an environment where 
all students are included in their, um, their lesson planning and how they're teaching. And we've also had workshops on learning differences and learning styles for our volunteers and our volunteer teachers and our tutors who share the program. Elizabeth, I, I have a question for you. I want to make sure that we, that we didn't lose Elizabeth there. Um, it, it, once again, it's really exciting having Elizabeth join us from Ghana. Um, and too bad our Wi-Fi is misbehaving, but I know my Wi-Fi in Virginia misbehaves all the time. So um, it is certainly uh, something we all have to deal with. So we'll just wait for a moment till uh, Elizabeth comes back. But I think the story that really impressed me about Elizabeth, and once again, we're going to put a link out on Access Chat dot com of the radio interview that um, I did with Elizabeth, which was very powerful, talking about the person Elizabeth was before the accident and her her journey through the accident and also learning who Elizabeth is today. And she obviously is a very strong woman that has a lot to say. She's a woman that, as she noted, has um, physical disabilities that you can see and suffered a tr very, very traumatic brain injury, but it doesn't mean that Elizabeth can't contribute to the world and she is contributing amazing things to the world. So despite people continuing to discount her all along her path, she's not going to let anybody get in her way. Elizabeth, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay, good. So Elizabeth, um, one thing I would like to talk about, and I, I know that you know we've, we've gone for about 30 minutes, so we'll have to close soon, but uh, one thing that you talked about during the radio interview that I thought was so powerful was how people treat you differently now based on before, the, um, before you had the accident. And also, Elizabeth, and I know you get embarrassed when people say this, but I just, as you know, I'm a very big fan of your work. And so, you know, I, I think there are all kind of ways that we stop ourselves from moving forward. But you didn't. You didn't stop yourself. And I know you were a track runner before. And you, you know, you understand how to, you understood really how to, you know, push your body. But can, can, do you mind just talking a little bit about, you know, how you learn to accept who you are and and become this really amazing woman. And I know you're still growing and changing and you want people to join you and the, the support of all girls in education and girls in education in Ghana. So we'll make sure that we put a link out to your, um, to your organization. But do you mind just exploring that topic a little bit about who is Elizabeth despite getting in this horrific accident? And Go ahead, Elizabeth. So I think I'll tell the first part of your question. Part of your power, I think clearly physically I've changed, but um, what a lot of people don't realize is the fact that intellectually I've also changed. Um, it takes me a longer time to, to read material, as I mentioned to you in our earlier conversation, read and comprehend material. And with that, I think sometimes now when people are trying to um, help me understand something or get me to understand something, they always feel as though, how come she's not getting it? And that's the number one way I believe that I've changed intellectually. And how did I come to accept myself as I am now? It's a journey. I, I guess I would say it's a journey. And I'm, I'm still on this journey. I can't say I fully have come to accept myself. But the most thing, maybe five percent, I accepted the. To go from a person who was running track and cross country and and being so active on campus, and now the story that I relate to you from this morning, someone looking at me and just feeling as though she's sick, so maybe she can't even walk a step, right? I, it's, it's a process for me, and I, I feel the more I live in Ghana, the more maybe I have to convince myself that everything's not, like, I'm not, I'm not so bad after all because I'm doing things that people who are quite able-bodied probably can't do. So it's a journey. That's, I guess that's my answer to that question. 
it's a and journey and it's a process. And, and it's a good answer because I live in each day. I think life is a journey and life is about contrast. Yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, our souls decide that you're going to uh, go through this horrific accident and, you know, and all that you, you walked, but you're not letting it slow you down. You are determined to make a difference. And I, I think, you know, what happened today when this gentleman said you're sick was it was a pity he was pitying you and and deciding mm -hmm. you were less than and i think a lot of the people yeah. in the access chat community can identify with that mm -hmm. and i i just you know i wanted to focus on millennials that were making mm -hmm. a difference and when harris introduced me to you i just I just am just so impressed and I know it's a journey you're and you're just starting your journey so who knows where Elizabeth will be at mm -hmm. you know what you will be able to accomplish in your life but I think you have a beautiful story to tell and I think it's unfolding still and there's a lot that everybody can learn from your journey because I think sometimes we use all kind of things to stop us from making a difference. I don't have enough money. I'm in the wrong job. You know, I'm depressed, which I really suffer for depression. And I, it, it, there, there's all kind of things yeah. that we let get in our way, including other stuff in our way. But I, I think the journey that you're on is, is a really powerful journey. And I know that you're making a huge difference for yes, the 12 yes. girls with and without disabilities that you're supporting through school. I mean, I, I, I recently, yesterday, yes. I saw a, uh, a really cool video um, that was put out by the United Nations, and it was talking about social good and women power. And there were women from all over the world, and um, some were Muslim women, some were African women, some were women from the United States, from Europe, and it was, um, it, it was that, uh, the um, Spice Girl song, uh, Do You Want to Be My Lover? Okay, but anyway, mm -hmm. they had done it in a way that yeah. was talking about powerful <laughs> social good. I loved it, I loved it. And I, I think that oftentimes not to diss men because men are beautiful and wonderful Antonio is a perfect example of that but the reality is I think that the way we have to change the world is to look at your journey and say wow that was a really really tough journey should we now underestimate Elizabeth well you can underestimate her but while you're underestimating her get out of her way as she changes the world in a positive way so I, I love that part of your story. I think it's very beautiful and it uh, really speaks to us and to our Access Chat community. And um, let me just ask Antonio. Antonio, do you want to ask Elizabeth another question before we give her the, um, the microphone again and let her, um, you know, have the last say today? No, uh, uh, no, what is, is you have the, you have the experience of uh, working in the United States today? where you know t t teaching kids and, and now you are uh, t doing doing the similar work uh, in ghana so uh, if, if you if you trying to find you know mm -hmm. some some balance here and go, go, going to to your story uh, what you think mm -hmm. you know how you can be a, a sort of a, a change maker in, in uh, within the people around you you know uh, uh, how people react to the fact that you know, oh, you are someone that came from the, from the United States. Now you are here. How you are able to manage sometimes that a situation mm -hmm. that some create. So sometimes I believe can create some sort of conflict within the relationships between between you and the people around you. How do you solve that that problem? Yeah. I um, reconcile that. I would say um, I I talk to my team a lot about this. Um, my, of my team, I think um, you notice um, um, fair, lighter skin than your average or your typical African. I don't look like your typical African because of my family's background. And so the fact that I don't look like a Ghanaian or an African, and then um, I also come from the US and I have this um, very prominent American accent. Initially, when I first came to Ghana, People felt as though, oh, who is this girl? Like, she, what's like, who is she? Why is she in this space trying to? Oh, it looks it looks like we lost Elizabeth again, and we'll um, we'll give her just a second to come back. But 
Um, I think, you know, it, it's, it's, I'm just fascinated with Elizabeth's story because the reality is we, um, we really all can make a difference and people sometimes will underestimate us and underestimate us in a lot of ways. And, and now she has all these, I mean, she was gone and, and then she came to the U S and now she came back and she has the, the physical disabilities, but she's determined to make a difference. It's, um, just the power of her story and the power of her journey. I, that's one reason why we wanted to have her on access chat. And um, it's too bad that the Ghana connection is uh, not behaving. But once again, you to learn more about Elizabeth's story, please do listen to the podcast. And also, if you like it, you know, write a positive review and subscribe too. But um, I think we need more stories like this. We need to hear from the Elizabeths of the world. Here on access chat, we try to feature you know, the heads of the Paralympics or, you know, the author of the Americans with Disability Act. But we also want to feature powerful stories that are unfolding like Elizabeth. Don't you agree, Antonio? Yes, I, I fully agree because you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's very interesting to read a blog post about, you know, about something or about intentions, but it's more valuable to, to bring real stories from, from real life especially in in areas of the world where we we usually don't have access to the same to to, inf, to the information or to the exact details about what is going on in there so it's it's very interesting to have to have stories coming from from different parts of the world in order to to broaden our views in, in relation to the area of and the scope of access chat I agree. I agree. And I, I know that we've really gone over our time, so we'll go ahead and end now. But um, Elizabeth is a really wonderful woman that's making a difference, and we're really proud to feature her on Access Chat. Um, I, I was trying to remember, Antonio, if we had featured anyone with a traumatic brain injury in the past. And I just, we probably have. We've been doing this for almost three years this coming November. But um, her story is just a really beautiful story and we'll make sure that we put out the links to her nonprofit and the work that she's doing in Ghana so that others can join and we'll also put a link to that really cool um, video that I mentioned that the United Nations did about girl power and making a difference but um, so thank you Antonio for your okay, time today pleasure. yes and, and we uh, will continue the conversation go ahead Antonio yeah. No, we, we just uh, we know that we are doing this connection between the United States, Ireland, and, uh, Ireland and Ghana. So we know that these type of issues with connections happen from time to time. Uh, no, it's better to do it than not to do it. So we assume the risk of sometimes having some issues with the quality of the call. That's how right. the world is today. Right. It's not perfect. So uh, we hope you to see you all on Twitter, and we'll be closing the the call for now. Thank you, Deborah. Bye bye. Bye bye.